Praise be to God, my dear friends. We've entered into the Holy Week. And as we're thrust into the deep waters, we abandon ourselves in trust to the Lord. We trust to the Lord. Sing with all the sons of glory. Sing the resurrection song. Death and sorrow, earth's dark story. To the former days belong. All around the clouds are breaking. Soon the storms of time shall cease. In God's likeness man awaking knows the everlasting peace. Oh, what glory far exceeding all that I have yet perceived. Holiest hearts of ages singing, never that full joy conceived. God has promised, Christ prepares it. There on high our welcome waits. Every humble spirit shares it. Christ has passed the eternal gates. <laughs> Life eternal, heaven rejoices. Jesus lives who once was dead. Join, O oh man, the deathless voices. Child of God, lift up thy head. Patriarchs from the distant ages, saints all longing for their heaven. Prophets, psalmists, seers, and sages all await the glory given. Life eternal, oh, what wonders crowd on faith, what joy unknown. When amidst earth's closing thunders, saints shall stand before the throne. Oh, to enter that bright portal, see that glowing firmament. Know with thee, O oh God immortal, Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. That was the hem. The Universal Church prayed yesterday on Passion Sunday because even for the irony of the passion and death of our Lord Jesus Christ, the resurrection lies in wait, the victory. And so even in the midst of it, the victory has already been won. That's why on the way of the cross, down the Via Dolorosa way, that day in Jerusalem, he was the one who said, Behold, I make all things new. That is lined with hope, even though we were unable to recognize him as a man. And that's the same for us. Brow beaten and backs beaten. I was just uh, communicating with a woman who said, you know, I have given everything. And it's true. We are squeezed in this wine press. This is the time of suffering and tremendous suffering. I believe it is in fulfillment of what the Lord said in those last days. The anxiety, the suffering will be surpassing to every other age. And he said, woe to this one living in that time. Woe to that one living in that time. Because it's 
unbelievable and tremendous suffering surpassing to any other time. Anxiety and stress and grief for what we see. A thousand fall at my side. Ten thousand fall at my right. And these jokers who are supposed to be keeping watch care nothing of all these happenings because they are wicked persons and that's why thrust into these things it is absolutely disconcerting to us but we have to hold on to hope and to those things which are certainly sure like that holy woman I mentioned of recently who said, adoration is what I saw as the key. And that's absolutely true. That's the Lord himself, the holy adoration of the blessed sacrament. That is the salvation of the world. So for sure, it's sure. <laughs> for sure, it's sure. And that has been a practice long abandoned by the vast majority of Catholics. I guarantee you there's probably, there's less than 10% of priests who are solicitous to have adoration of the Blessed Sacrament in any substance for their people, much less concerned about it. They might be pushed to do it because of the, the cry of the widow or the widow that's constantly knocking on the door. <laughs> but you will find few priests whose hearts are so enamored to adoration. And that's the thing I love most about a priest by the name of Father Jeff Fashing. He does adoration uh, for hours upon hours daily. Or the holy preacher to God, Father John Karapi. He does six hours of adoration a day. A lot of people are like, Whatever happened to Father John Karapi? He was such a great preacher. He affected my life in this way. He affected my life in that way. Rest at ease that he's doing a far heavier lifting in the spiritual realm than he ever did by his preaching. And I admit, and I recognize that his preaching was surpassing to everyone. I believe in the history of Holy Mother Church, save one man, St. Paul. In other words, in the heart of hearts of the poor little cowboy, I believe that Father John Karapi touched and affected more people by his preaching than anyone else besides St. Paul. God bless Father John Karapi. He does six hours of ador adoration a day, real time. That's big time. And I hope that you are somehow moved to recognize that we have to adore the Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. And that you can do it. And what's the other pillar? Our Blessed Mother Mary. The Queen of Heaven and Earth. Whose heel it was permitted to be the one to crush the head of the serpent. Not the sword of Michael the Archangel. Not the sword of David the king. Not the strength of Samson. Or Jacob who wrestled with the angel. But it was la femenina. La morenita. The most beautiful, faithful and humble creature of the history of, of creation. The virgin blessed mother. Maria. And that's why, as Father John Karapi said, my mother wears combat boots. We pray the Holy Rosary with love and devotion. And poor as we are, we keep sojourning, walking in that prayer. So I hope that you can understand and rise up to it and not be shocked by the wicked happenings of this time. 
I will read you a few excerpts from the sacred scripture to delineate to you where we are so that you may be in the knowing and so that you may confidently be able to walk through these holy days. Is it any surprise that the world hates us? Jesus was the one who said they hated me first. Do not be afraid and do not be shocked because how much more will they hate you? I saw an article written by that jack wagon priest, Father James Martin, homosexual, extraordinaire, promoter of homosexuality, degenerate and Judas to Jesus to say the least. <laughs> Judas to Jesus to say the least and he opined in a commentary that you know it's been saying and it will say in the sacred scriptures the Jews were the ones who persecuted Jesus to death and he was trying to say they they didn't have the authority it was Pilate and the Romans what an idiot that guy's an idiot it's true the Jews didn't have authority and that's why they had to ask Pilate the permission. He was the governor of Judea, the procurator. So no peoples occupied by the Romans had the authority to, to execute anyone. That's why the Jews and who are the Jews spoken of in that way at the sacred scriptures. It's precisely the authentic religious leaders to God's people. And that is pointedly the Pharisees. They were the bishops, if you will, of the covenant to Moses, them and the high priests, the composition of the Sanhedrin were the ones who, who put Jesus to death. And they hated him and despised him. Listen, that's why Father James Martin deserves a solid backhand from the first priest of the church, the holy apostles Peter, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, Philip, Bartholomew, and the holy priest St. Paul himself. They'd backhand the fire out of James Martin. Sodomite, fake priest, offense to the priesthood of our Lord Jesus Christ. A mockery to theology and a self-fashioned. Can't even say man to that guy. He's terrible. And he's in full-blown commission to the original sin and with intention, with wicked intention, trying to deceive the people of God. And those Jews, those men who are first responsible and in the first degree responsible for the death of our Lord Jesus Christ are the same men who are crucifying his body in our time, the modern day Pharisees, wicked, wicked men. And they are in the first degree responsible for all of these happenings, not only in the church, but in the world, complicit and in cooperation to world leaders. But they are the first of responsibility. And they will be the most accountable. Listen to the gospel from last Friday. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus moved about within Galilee. 
He did not wish to travel in Judea because the Jews were trying to kill him. Jews equals Pharisees. Pharisees equals the legitimate and authentic religious leaders to God's people. And they were the ones in the first degree responsible for the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wicked political animals who negotiated their desire unto Pilate by political sabotage. Remember when they told him, we have only one king, that's Caesar. They hated the Caesar. But in order to push Pilate, they said, if you, if you release this man named Jesus, you're no friend of Caesar. And that's where Pilate got put in a rock in a hard place. You remember he tried to release Jesus three times. That shoots tremendous holes in the proposals of that jack wagon priest, that Judas priest, Father James Martin. He ought to be tarred and feathered and much worse things. Because the Jews were trying to kill him. And then how did it go yesterday? Recorded in the Passion. In the Gospel of St. Mark. It said in this way. Listen carefully. Let's see here. Where are we? Oh yeah. We're doing a little going back and forth. The passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Listen, right out of the box. Right out of the, the blocks. The Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were to take place in two days time. So the chief priests and the scribes, the Jews... And the Pharisees were seeking a way to arrest him by treachery and put him to death. <laughs> That's what we're dealing with right now. Real time. Current day. 2024. And that's why we have to put ourselves to, to understand and to see and to grasp what are the mo most important things. Because our faith does not depend upon any man. My faith does not depend upon the good behavior or lack thereof of any man. It's true that we desire examples and good examples. Holy men, saints that helps us. But that is not what determines our faith to our Lord Jesus Christ. I was just speaking the other day to a beautiful man. I call him the cool dude. And he's beautiful. And he was lamenting that he has to endure a certain priest of the Lord in a certain parish that he goes to. And it's true, this guy, I mean, he... He's in league with the Sodomites. He is a Sodomite. And although it's not as easy to detect him as it is to some others, he absolutely is. I call him Satchel Boy. And see, the Sodomites, they, they don't think right on anything. Or their way of thinking is twisted and perverted because of their perversion. And that's why everything that they do is tainted and tainted in a very bad way. And it's possible for, for one of that inclination and even of that sin to, to become holy to God, but not in the priesthood. There's no, there's no room in the holy priesthood whatsoever for a sodomite. 
and in the gamut or spectrum of possibility of ill effect to the church in every point in that gamut they are destroyers and that's like this priest and this guy was telling me you know father it's hard for me to even look at that guy but he said this and I was so proud of him he said but father I don't go to worship or because of that guy I don't go for him I go for the Lord I'm there to worship the Lord and that is absolutely true and so somehow in these wicked times we have to swallow a lot of wicked things in order to be able to eat the bread of life and that's what the liturgy pointed to us pointed us to just this past saturday on the precipice of entering into the holy week and that's what motivates and drives us that's our end game that's what moves us and that's why it is necessary for us to understand what is at the heart of all things and that is the covenant new and everlasting the body and blood of christ that is our faith and that is what our faith is ordered to that's what motivates us and keeps us despite all the peripheral realities of the faith that is the core our faith is christocentric christ is at the heart of all things and just as he was we will also be tremendously disappointed and just as he entering into Jerusalem stood on that place they call Dominus Flavit, opposite the east gate to the holy city of Jerusalem, Jesus wept as he looked upon the city of David. And we also weep bitter tears. We have given everything and we have the intention to give everything and we will not be disappointed. That's why my dear people, I encourage you and that's why I remind you and repeat to you in different ways as I find possible to reiterate to you these fundamental truths of our faith. Listen to these readings from the Office of Reading on Saturday. This first one from the Sacred Scriptures, the letter to the Hebrews. The priesthood of Christ in the new covenant. This is at the heart of everything. The main point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest. Christ is the high priest and he's the only priest. And he is the power of the priesthood. I just told some people the other day. Father Clay don't have any authority or power to forgive sins and neither does any priest in themselves. That power and authority comes from Christ and from his priesthood to which the poverty of we human priests, we men, we sinners are grafted into oneness to the priesthood of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is his priesthood. It is his authority and it is certainly manifest unto us in every age as he promised through the holy priesthood for the forgiveness of sins and this priest christ has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty of heaven minister of the sanctuary and of that true tabernacle set up not by man but by the Lord. That's why I constantly remind people, the church is not a human institution like all these other churches. When you look at any other church, sometimes people say, and they say unknowingly and fool foolishly and erroneously, they say, I'm not Catholic, I'm Christian. When you hear people say that, when you hear anyone say that, I'm not Catholic, I'm Christian, that person is can easily be defined as an idiot not knowing 
at all of what they speak. Because the Catholic Church is the Christian Church. Christ is the one who established her and sustains her. Christ is the one who upholds the church in the covenant new and everlasting, His body and blood. And He is the one who promised by the authority and protection of the Holy Spirit in which He sealed His church that the gates of hell will not prevail against her. And that's what gives us confidence to keep moving forward. We are not overly, we are not overwhelmed by all these wicked things. And it's true that the walls are being beaten and battered and they strike together with hatchet and pickaxe. Besieged is the church, but she will never be destroyed. Penetrated has she been, Lord have mercy, but she will never be destroyed because it is the Lord Himself who sustains and upholds her the Holy Spirit. And Christ is the head of His body, the church. The true ta tabernacle, not set up by men, but by the Lord. She is divinely instituted and she is divine, unlike any other so-called church established by men. Now every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices, hence the necessity for this one to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest. For there are priests already offering gifts which the law prescribes. The sacrifices of the priesthood of the old covenant, those of bullocks and goats. They offer worship in a sanctuary which is only a copy and a shadow of the heavenly one. That's why the church is divine. When you go into the sanctuary of the church, if you had the eyes to see and the ears to hear in any Catholic church, her true substance and where she is perpetuated from is the sanctuary in the kingdom of heaven. These other ones offer worship in sanctuary, which is only a copy or a shadow of that one. For Moses, when about to erect the tabernacle was warned, see that you make everything according to the pattern shown to you on the mountain. Jesus has obtained a more excellent ministry now, just as he is mediator of a covenant, a better covenant, founded on better promises. That's what He came to establish. The covenant new and everlasting, His body and blood as a ransom for the salvation of the world. The bread from heaven, the bread of angels. In the first covenant, if it had been faultless, there would have, have been no place for a second one. But God, finding fault with them, said, Days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. This is the heart of everything, the covenant new and everlasting and to which He opened this relationship of covenant to every people, nation, race, and tongue, to renew it in Israel, His chosen people, but to open the doors to us, Mexicanos, gente de Alemania, gente de Argentina. There are beautiful, faithful people in Argentina and there are very unfaithful people from Argentina. Lord have mercy. Especially the modern day Pharisees. But this new and everlasting covenant will be established. It will not be like the covenant I made with their fathers, the day that I took them by the hand and led them forth from the land of Egypt. Exponentially greater is the Eucharist than all the covenants of old. And it is the fulfillment of each foresaid 
covenant. For they broke my covenant and I grew weary of them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will place my law in their minds and I will write it upon their hearts like that holy man. I told you the story of who was so exacerbated with the, the foolishness of the priest he has to endure or that woman worn out and all that she has poured out for God. I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach their own fellow citizens or their brothers saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from least to greatest. We long for that day, Lord. We long for that day in, in its fullness. I will forgive their evil doing and their sins. I will remember no more. Little Gusty is standing right over there. She's right over there. She's a little donkey. And I never forget that story of St. Anthony of Padua in the Eucharist. Because by the obstinance and stubbornness and stiff necks and hard heads of human beings in every age, We have to teach and convince to this covenant new and everlasting with all that we have. And there was a, in this one place where St. Anthony went to, priest of the Lord, and he was preaching to the people. There was a prominent member of that community who challenged to him and who was subverting the people. And so St. Anthony said, we'll make a challenge. Even a donkey can recognize the Lord. Even though you foolish man, ass of a man as you are, cannot. So you take and tie up the donkey and don't allow it to eat or drink, provide it no water and no hay for three days. And on the third day, we will gather here with all the people and see to what is it that governs the little donkey, the Lord or the temporal things. And so they starved and made thirst the donkey for three days. And on the third day, this proud braggart brought hay on one side of the plaza and on the other side was to come in Saint Anthony the priest of the Lord with the monstrance and the blessed sacrament the covenant new and everlasting the body blood soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus the Christ and so they brought in the donkey and immediately he started on a bee line to the hay and water to the water and hay because he would have drank first before he ate. But at that very moment, entering in from the opposite side of the plaza was the priest of the Lord with the Lord himself. And the donkey stopped dead in his tracks and looked back, turned about face and went up to approach the Lord and his priest went down on its front two haunches and bowed its head to the ground and all the people of the town were converted and even the proud braggart that's amazing but the two leggeds human beings that's a much heavier lift that's a much heavier lift and more obstinate is the human person than a donkey.
the Lord continued saying, I will forgive their evil doing. That's the forgiveness of sins that Jesus established in the priesthood. When he breathed his spirit unto the first priest of the church, not to all peoples, to the first priest of the, of the church, the apostles. He was addressing them. He was with the apostles, not a crowd of people. He breathed his spirit unto these priests. And he told them, whoever sins you forgive on earth will be forgiven in heaven. Whoever sins you do not forgive on earth will not be forgiven in heaven. He gave to poor men in the priesthood of the covenant, new and everlasting, the authority to forgive sins. And that's why we go to the Holy Confession. And that's why we love the Holy Confession. And he said, I will remember their sins no more. How magnificent and wonderful the Lord. When he says a new covenant, he declares the first one obsolete. And what has become obsolete has grown old and is close to disappearing. That's why we put ourselves to understand the most important things. And let's continue to reflect further by one of my favorite bishops in the history of the church. Beautiful bishop. Because not all bishops are beautiful. And not all bishops are holy. But this one was. We are soon going to share in the Passover. St. Gregory Nazianzen, Bishop. We are soon going to share in the Passover and although we still do so only in a symbolic way, the symbolism already has more clarity than it possessed in the former times because under the law, the Passover was, if I may dare to say, only a symbol of a symbol. Before long, however, when the Word drinks the new wine with us in the kingdom of His Father, we shall be keeping the Passover in a yet more perfect way. And with deeper understanding, He will reveal to us and make clear what He has so far only partially disclosed. For this wine, so familiar to us now, is eternally new. Amazing. For it, it, it is for us to learn that this drinking is and from Him to teach us. He has to communicate this knowledge to His disciples because teaching is food, even for the teacher. So let us take part in the Passover prescribed by the law, not in a literal way, but according to the teaching of the gospel, not in an imperfect way, but perfectly, not only for a time, but eternally. Let us regard as our home, the heavenly Jerusalem, not the earthly one, the city glorified by angels, not the one laid waste by armies. Lord have mercy. We are not required to sacrifice young bulls or rams, beasts with horns and hooves that are more dead than alive and devoid of feeling, but instead let us join the choirs of angels in offering God upon His heavenly altar a sacrifice of praise. He must now pass through the first veil and approach the second, turning our eyes toward the Holy of Holies, which I will, I will say more, we must sacrifice ourselves to God. Each day and in, e in everything that we do, accepting all that happens to us for the sake of the Word. That's why we don't lose heart. That's why I told that woman and that man, as I tell all women and men, forward boldly, keep pushing, don't give up. 
imitating His passion by our own sufferings. Because our sufferings are not in vain. They imitate and are joined to those of the Lord Himself. And honoring His blood by the shedding of our own. We must be ready to be crucified. We must be ready to be crucified. If you are a Simon of Cyrene, take up your cross and follow Christ. If you are crucified beside Him, like one of the thieves, now like the good thief, acknowledge your God for your sake and because of your sin. Christ Himself was regarded as a sinner for His sake, therefore. You must cease to sin. How beautifully put by the Holy Bishop. That's why we fight against sin. We never surrender that fight. We are sinners. But we make it our business to be about the good fight. Worship Him who was hung on the cross because of you. Even if you are hanging there yourself. Go to adoration. Go to worship Him. Derive some benefit from the very shame. Purchase salvation with your own death. And it's true that it's hard to suffer in our own lives, in our own persons, in many, many ways. But we constantly remind ourselves that our suffering has merit and value. It adds or makes deposit to the economy of salvation. And that's why we never grow wearied of it. We are wearied, but we never throw in the towel. We keep hearing Mick yelling, Get up, Rocky! Get up, Rock! And we keep fighting. I hope that you understand and that by grace itself, you draw the strength to keep fighting until your last breath. Enter paradise with Jesus and discover how far you have fallen. Contemplate the glories there and leave the other scoffing thief to die outside in his own blasphemy. If you are a Joseph of Arimathea, go to the one who ordered his crucifixion and ask for Christ's body. This is a perfect example of these wicked modern day Pharisees. Wicked things that we have to endure. Even though we have to endure them, we do not allow them to separate us from receiving the body and blood of Christ. We do not allow their bad behaviors to separate us from the covenant new and everlasting, from taking the Holy Communion in our own mouth. Make your own expiation for the sins of the whole world. Just right now, we're about to begin on Good Friday, the Novena of Divine Mercy. And I hope that you pray it again this year. If you are Nicodemus, like the man who worshipped God by night, bring spices and prepare Christ's body for His burial. I have to believe that even in this time where priests, are coward and they don't speak up that there are a lot of Nicodemuses. I have to believe that. That there are many priests who do not speak up out of fear of the Sanhedrin. Out of fear and fear of consequence that they don't speak up but that they believe in their hearts and they are convicted in their hearts and that the time for their rising is near. How great will be the day when all the priests of the Lord rise up 
and stand against the modern day Pharisees. That will be a great and glorious day. And I have to believe. Even though I'm not certain, I have to believe and I push myself to hope that in fact there are many Nicodemuses in our time. If you are one of the Marys or Salome or Joanna weeping in the early morning, be the first to see the stone rolled back and even the angels perhaps and Jesus himself. What beautiful words from a beautiful bishop to help us to enter into the Holy Week. That was from Saturday this past. And it's true that we live in the new Passover. You remember the, the first Passover, the covenant of Moses, where the Lord told to the people, procure for yourself a spotless, unblemished lamb and slaughter it, taking its blood and putting it on the lentils and the doorposts of your homes in Egypt. And this night I will send an angel who will take the firstborn of man and beast alike in Egypt, who will kill the firstborn of man and beast alike in Egypt. So the angel will go to each house, but when he sees the sign of the blood of the lamb marked on your house, he will pass over that house. And not take the firstborn. And to us, the new Passover, the new and everlasting Passover, is no longer the blood of, of little lambs, but the blood of the singular, spotless, unblemished lamb that's Christ, the Lamb of God, El Cordero de Dios. Y Él es únicamente el Cordero de Dios. Y la salvación es solamente por su sangre y su cuerpo. The only expiation for our sins and the only salvation to humanity is the body and blood of Christ. And that's why he said very clearly and what is a tremendous risk to people who have gone out of the Catholic Church is he said of this covenant, Amen, Amen, I say to you, if you do not eat my flesh and drink my blood, I don't know you. You have no life within you and you will be in the darkness where there is wailing and grinding of teeth. That was at the Baptist church that I know in very beautiful, beautiful pastor, beautiful people. But the pastor erroneously told to a boy, you cannot have communion. I guess they have communion like once a month or every now and then. He told him, you, you cannot have it yet because you have not been baptized. And in some way, I mean, there is, there is something to be respected in that, you know, that at least they're trying. But that's not even communion. That's not the Eucharist. Because the Eucharist requires the priesthood. So whatever it is, a cracker and grape juice or bread and even if it is wine. It's only bread and wine because a Baptist minister has no authority to the priesthood of our Lord Jesus Christ and no authority which Christ established in the priesthood to affect the covenant new and everlasting, what we call transubstantiation, where the bread and wine substantially become the body and blood of Christ. That's only 
in the Catholic Church. And that's why it is a tremendous risk. I mean tremendous, like the greatest risk in the history of the world for a person to be outside of the Catholic Church, outside of the covenant, and therefore equated to very risky to be outside of salvation. I would never do that. And even for all the bad behaviors of these modern day Pharisees and many people who are duped into being traitors to Christ with them, even for all those things that are stacked up against the church, I would never go out of her. I would never allow anything out of this world or of this world to separate me from the sacramental life of Holy Mother Church. That's a little cowboy priest. And I hope you understand. And I hope that you push hard to have a great Holy Week. These are holy and spiritual days. Go to confession. Very, very important. And prepare yourself to go. I hope that you find yourself as a participant in the Mass of the Lord's Supper on Holy Thursday. In the reading of the Passion in the veneration of the cross and the prayers and the reception of the Holy Eucharist on Good Friday. And that in full anticipation, and it should be possible for you to go to the Holy Easter Vigil, the mother of all liturgies of Holy Mother Church. And that you celebrate with full heart the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, our hope, our joy, our banner. The Lord be with you. And through the intercession of Saint Pope, Saint Holy Bishop Gregory of Nazianzen, through the intercession of Saint Paul and Saint Peter and all the holy apostles, May Almighty God bless to you and your family for a beautiful and holy, holy week. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We love you. Adios. Bye.